Okay, you're good. All right, now to find where they move the, the broadcast one to. All right, I'm about to click broadcast. All right, thanks everyone for, for joining the webinar. Um, sorry we're kicking things off a little bit late. Today we're going to be talking about an introduction to, to DevSecOps. Um, a little about me. My name is Stephen Tarana. I'm a CDF ambassador. I'm a senior lead technologist at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, so my job on the day-to-day -day is, is helping modernize legacy applications, uh, implementing platforms as a service using Kubernetes. And uh, through a lot of my work, I've been pretty involved in the open source Jenkins community. So I'm a maintainer of a Jenkins plugin uh, we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and I participate in the Jenkins pipeline authoring special interest group focused on how can we improve the experience of authoring Jenkins pipelines. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're, we're going to talk about what exactly is DevSecOps. Um, July was the security month for the, the CDF newsletter. Um, so we're going to talk about how can you embed security in your software development lifecycle. Um, we're going to talk about what are some of the challenges associated with doing this at scale across an organization. And then we'll talk about how uh, the Jenkins templating engine, uh, the plugin that I help maintain, can, can ease some of those challenges. So the place I usually like to start is what does DevSecOps actually mean? Um, I've had the, the privilege of talking to quite a few people about uh, DevSecOps, and I've, I've learned one thing, and that's that no one actually agrees on, on what it means. Um, so I'm going to throw a definition into the ring and say that uh, DevSecOps is all about incorporating security into every step of the software development lifecycle. Um, and throughout this talk, we'll, we'll jump into a couple different ways that you can go about doing that. Um, to kick things off, uh, at a high-level overview, you've got a couple different steps involved. Um, all of these different kinds of security testing that we're going to talk about in detail work together to, to build a, a trusted software supply chain to production. All right, so a common analogy when we're building DevSecOps pipelines is to think of your pipeline like an assembly line, right? And what, what kinds of testing or validation can we incorporate along that assembly line to ensure the applications we're building are secure? And that can manifest itself in a couple different ways, making sure dependencies are secure, the code itself, uh, the artifacts we're building, the infrastructure, and so on, All right? So let's dive into each one of these in detail. So the first step in building that trusted software supply chain or, or implementing DevSecOps is making sure that our third-party application dependencies are secure. Right? When we're building applications, we're, we're often not building them from scratch. There's plenty of very helpful third-party libraries out there uh, that can accelerate our ability to build applications. The problem is that we don't actually know where these, these dependencies are necessarily coming from. And oftentimes, they might have vulnerabilities associated with them. So the first thing you want to do is, you know, if, you, if we continue with that assembly line analogy, um, these third-party application dependencies are really uh, like the raw materials you're pulling into your application. Um, so there's a lot of great tools in the industry to help ensure that our, our dependencies are secure. There's, from an open source perspective, there's OWASP Dependency Checker, which can which can scan your dependencies. There's also tools like uh, Nexus, Sonatype Nexus has tools called Firewall and Lifecycle, which can scan your, your application dependencies as you pull them into your environment and then continuously, right? New CVEs are coming out on a daily basis. So you need to continuously be, be monitoring uh, if there's any known vulnerabilities associated with the materials in your application. So now that we know that the materials we're pulling in, to our application are secure. The next step is ensuring that the code we write doesn't have inherent vulnerabilities. So the, the most common examples of this would be things like hard-coded IP addresses or, or password variables. Um, but another more complex example might be something like if you're using C for, for lower level uh, application development, there's a lot of like memory exploitation vulnerabilities that can take place. 
So there's a lot of tools out there as well. The most prevalent that, that I see being used is SonarCube. So SonarCube can can assist in making sure that your code as written doesn't have vulnerabilities. It also helps with, with pull request reviews. So being able to, to scan your application for you know, industry best practices and looking for things like dead code or, or places where there's, there's opportunities to improve your application. That allows the, the actual pull request reviewer to focus on some of the more uh, nuanced aspects of, of code review, like making sure it aligns with your, your team standards and, and things like that. So up until this point, we've pulled in secure uh, third-party dependencies. We then wrote our application and made sure that the code itself doesn't have vulnerabilities associated with it. Then the next step comes uh, for actually you know, building and deploying our application. I like to say that security vulnerabilities come in two flavors. You've got vulnerable packages like third-party application dependencies or uh, operating system level packages, uh, but then you also have vulnerable infrastructure. Right, so you know, uh, exposing port 22 on your container image or opening port 22 on your EC2 server to you know the public internet uh, is an easy way to to ensure that you might have a rough time from a security perspective. So a lot of the tools that do scanning can also uh, validate and make sure that you know, the infrastructure you've deployed is compliant with different security control profiles. And there's a lot of them out there, right? There's, there's FISMA compliance and HIPAA and managing PII. Um, so there's a ton of different guidelines out there, things like uh, CIS benchmarks. Um, I happen to work in the federal space where there's there are things called secure technical implementation guides or STIGs. And these are security controls that uh, it's recommended you implement to ensure your infrastructure is, is hardened. Um, so it's not enough to just make sure that the application itself is secure. You need to make sure that it's running on secure infrastructure. Um, the next piece is we can actually build and deploy our application. So now that we have a deployed application, we can start doing uh, some more dynamic testing, right? So penetration testing um, is a way to actually attack a deployed application and see if it's susceptible to, to common exploitations. Um, some common examples of this would be uh, you have a website that has a form and then, you know, making sure it's not susceptible to like, remote code execution or SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Um, so there's tools like OAuth Zap that can help with doing penetration testing. I'm sure there's a couple hundred others that you could incorporate as well. Um, but this is a, a good way to make sure that your application isn't susceptible to some of the more common attacks that it might experience out in the wild. Um, along the same vein of compliance, you've got accessibility compliance or accessibility assurance. So this is making sure that the applications that we build are accessible and inclusive for everybody. Um, some of the, the more common examples of this would be if you have an image on your website, making sure that it has an alt text. Um, you wanna make sure that the application you're building is going to be consumable by, by screen readers, um, it's important to note that there's no tool out there that's going to tell you with 100% confidence that your application is secure, but what it will do, will do is tell you if you're not, right? So uh, Section 508 compliance for accessibility definitely has some more complex or gray areas of the law. So you want to be able to give developers fast feedback on those easy to check accessibility issues so that those that have to do manual testing for accessibility, compliance, and assurance uh, can focus on those more nuanced, nuanced areas. So throughout this process, we pulled in secure raw materials in our application dependencies. We've written an application and secured it using um, something like SonarCube to do static code analysis and make sure the, the application isn't written insecurely. Um, one thing that, that we left off this list that that I shouldn't have is container image scanning. So frequently with uh, modern software delivery comes containerization, right? and that brings with it a new artifact in the container image that you wanna scan. So those same tools that do continuous compliance to scan uh, for security controls and make sure that you've implemented all the controls in a profile 
can also do container image scanning. Right? If you're going out and fetching a, an image from Docker Hub without validating the source of that image or the contents of it, um, you could be opening yourself up to all kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, I don't remember the exact image, but I remember there was a uh, image on Docker Hub last year where uh, had a couple million downloads and was doing Bitcoin mining. Right? So you want to make sure that the way you're packaging your application doesn't bring with it inherent vulnerabilities. Um, right? So we have the secure dependencies, the secure code, the secure packaging, the secure underlying infrastructure, actually deploying it and making sure that uh, the interface of that application is secure, um, and then making sure that the application we're building is accessible to everybody using tools like Google Lighthouse or uh, Ally. Um, so now we can actually go and deploy the application, right? So that's that's where we can do runtime monitoring. So there's, you know, we, we integrated all these kinds of security testing, but that's still not enough, right? Vul new vulnerabilities are introduced on a, a daily basis, and we need to make sure that uh, even though we brought in all this security testing, that we're still monitoring the environment. You know, it, take containerization as an example. If I'm deploying my microservice-based application using something like Kubernetes, I know exactly what is supposed to be happening on that cluster, right? Every container has a set process that it should be running. So I can use tools like Falco or, or Sysdig Secure or Twistlock to do continuous runtime security monitoring to be able to alert if the application starts behaving in a way that's, that's unexpected, right? The most common example that gets used is if a new shell session is open in a container in production, that's probably a good sign that, that something's happening that shouldn't be. So a lot of these tools can do alerting to let you know that that happened, but they can also do some, some pretty advanced forensics um, and response to be able to go terminate that container. So the second someone is able to gain a, a shell session into your container, you can uh, delete it and then send notifications that something's happening that, that shouldn't be. So you know, all the security testing is in addition to all the other kinds of quality assurance that we want to bake into our CI, CD, or DevSecOps pipelines. Things like unit testing, um, measuring code coverage for ingestion into Sonar Cube, doing browser-based test automation or, or API integration testing. Basically pull a word out of the dictionary and put testing on the end of it. Um, so implementing these practices at scale can quickly get pretty complicated, right? There's not a single tool that is used regardless of tech stack for all these different kinds of testing. If I have a front end application, I might be doing my unit testing with Karma or Jeff. Um, if I have a back end application, maybe I'm using JUnit or, or Spock to write my unit tests. Maybe I'm executing them with Maven or Gradle or, or Ant or NTM. Um, it, some teams might be using something like Fortify for static code analysis, where other teams could be using SonarCube. So implementing these practices at scale often results in you know, many individualized pipelines that can be difficult to maintain. Uh, and on top of that, not too many folks are, are necessarily experts at constructing these mature DevSecOps pipelines. So a few years ago, we, uh, you know, we wanted to try to figure out how can we make this easier. Um, it was taking too long to build mature pipelines. Uh, every team that needed one was kind of reinventing the wheel. It was getting a little too complex, right? If I have 60 microservices, for example, each living in their own source code repository, uh, some of them might be using different tools. And the way a lot of the CICD tools in the industry work right now is you need to create a pipeline definition for each application individually, which can quickly result in a, a pretty difficult to maintain system. Right, so from a standardization perspective, if I've got multiple definitions of the pipeline, how do I actually know that, that all of those pipelines are implementing the organizationally required checks from a security perspective? Um, and then continuous improvement. Right, so I, I've been on teams where I'm responsible as, as a DevOps engineer facilitating a DevSecOps pipeline to, to maintain the, the pipeline infrastructure and definition for those 60 apps. So no one gets the pipeline right on the first try, right? We're continuously incorporating lessons learned into our automated software delivery processes. So another one of the, the challenges associated with 
building pipelines on a per application basis is now if I want to add a new tool or I want to change the, the business logic of the pipeline, I have to go do that in across every source code repository, um, which can result in a lot of you know, operational overhead. I have to, to talk to all of the individual development teams and coordinate a migration to change the pipeline, and it can quickly get pretty cumbersome. So one approach to solving some of these challenges is the Jenkins templating engine. Um, so the idea here is that all of our, our DevSecOps pipelines, regardless of tech stack, follow a common business process, right? We're gonna build something, test it, we're gonna you know, package it into an artifact, deploy it somewhere, scan it. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a front-end app using NPM to run tests, packaging static HTML for deployment to an S3 bucket, or if it's a backend API using Maven to execute tests, building a container image and using Helm to deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster, that business process to, to implement the pipeline doesn't change. Um, so it would be fantastic if instead of having to build a pipeline for each team individually, we could create common, reusable, inheritable pipeline templates that are tool agnostic, and then enable multiple development teams to inherit this same pipeline template at the exact same time, while still being flexible enough to, to plug in the right tools for the job. Right, so the Jenkins templating engine is a plugin that enables the, the creation of these tool agnostic pipeline templates to be able to plug and play with exactly what tools are being used to implement the steps of that template. So let's see what that, that looks like. Um, and this is an example for, for using scripted pipeline. Right? So on the left, we have a pipeline that's packaging something with Maven and then doing static code analysis using Centercube. And on the right, we have a, a pipeline that's using Gradle and then packaging, uh, doing static code analysis through Centercube. So both of these pipelines, even though one team happens to be using Maven and another team happens to be using Gradle, um, are, can be represented by the same generic process. Right, they're both going to do a build, and then they're both going to do a static code analysis with Sonar Cube. So it would be awesome if I could take these, you know, individualized Jenkins files out of the individual source code repos, and instead define a, a common pipeline template that both teams have to use. And to accomplish that with with the templating engine, I just have to shuffle the, the code around a bit. Right, so I can create a centralized pipeline configuration repository. I can create in JTE, what's called a library source. So we're gonna have a, a Maven and a Gradle library. They both implement a build step. Uh, and then a Sonar Cube library, which is gonna implement a static code analysis step. Right, so on the right-hand side, we can see that the pipeline code to make this possible is the exact same. We just organized it a little bit differently to be able to load in different functionality uh, depending on what tools the team is using. So alongside these pipeline libraries, we can also create a common pipeline template uh, called the Jenkins file. It just lives outside of any one source code repository in a centralized repo. repo. And then instead of having a often 700 line Jenkins file in every source code repository, we can instead give the, the applications their own pipeline configuration file. And it, all it's responsible for is, is implementing that pipeline template. All right, so this template says we're gonna do a build and we're gonna do static code analysis. Um, the individual application can tell, can tell the pipeline, uh, I'm gonna use Maven and I'm gonna use Sonarcube or I'm gonna use Gradle and I'm gonna use Sonarcube. The actual functionality for what those steps means are encapsulated by the libraries. Um, so we get better pipeline, reuse, uh, pipeline code reuse, uh, better standardization, but we can still be flexible allowing teams to choose the right tool for the job. Um, but we can still do a little bit better than this, right? Those libraries that we're creating aren't super helpful unless they can take input parameters, right? So on the right here, we have an example of expanding that center cube library a bit to be able to take some input parameters. Uh, if anyone has used the center cube scanner plugin before, you, you set up a center cube installation uh, it would be great to be able to parameterize which Sonar Cube installation that's configured in Jenkins do we want to use. Um, some teams might want to enforce the whether or not to, to 
to fail the pipeline if the center cube quality gate fails. Um, so all of these, these parameters get exposed through the pipeline configuration file, right? So in this configuration file, you'd say libraries, sonar cube, and then you could pass in some parameters, the, the scanner version and whether or not to enforce the quality gate or the example used here. And on the right, in the upper right-hand side of the code, we can see that JTE will auto-wire a config variable, which exposes the, the library configuration that's been provided. Right, so now as an organization, you can maintain a portfolio of these libraries, which act as building blocks to implement a common pipeline template. Um, there's no reason that each team should have to Google SonarCube plus Jenkins and find the 10 lines of code that do static code analysis with SonarCube from a Jenkins pipeline. Um, we can accelerate everyone's ability to quickly build the mature pipelines by reusing uh, the pipeline code in a way that allows us to pass parameters in. Um, and then from a configuration standpoint, we can still do a little bit better, right? So all the way on the right here, we have the desired pipeline configuration. Uh, the Maven app is going to use Maven and SonarCube. The Gradle app is going to use Gradle and SonarCube. Um, but let's say we want to apply some organizational governance to this setup and say everyone has to use the SonarCube library. Right. If you're in a, an organization that ha wants to apply some, some strict governance to making sure the security gates are implemented, uh, for example, you could set up a organizational pipeline configuration that says everyone has to use SonarCube for static code analysis. They have to use something like Claire or, or Sysdig Secure or Anchor for container image scanning. Um, but you're going to allow the individual teams to tell you which build tool they're using. Right, so the same way in, in Maven, you have a parent POM file. In the templating engine, you can create hierarchies of pipeline configuration that get aggregated together and result in the, the aggregated pipeline configuration that's used to implement the, the pipeline template. Um, in the way the templating engine works is that you create governance hierarchies that map directly to your Jenkins job hierarchies. So if you have a configuration that should be applied to every JTE pipeline, you set that up and manage Jenkins configure system. And then on each folder in Jenkins, and that applies to multi-branch pipelines or GitHub organization jobs, you can also create uh, what are called governance tiers to be able to provide these library, these pipeline configurations. So now you know you can give teams as much flexibility as you want to, or you could dial the governance way up and say this is the pipeline that you have to inherit, and these are the libraries you're inheriting but please tell us which, which build tool you're going to use, for example. All right, so what are, what are the takeaways? Um, the first is that the, the templating engine is really a framework for developing tool agnostic template workflows that can be reused. Um, nothing in, in that example we saw was, you know, particularly hard-coded. You can create whatever libraries you need to. Those libraries can provide whatever steps they want to. Right, so this is a framework for being able to create tool agnostic pipeline templates that teams inherit. If you want all of your steps to come from a, one library, that's a perfectly valid way to do it. Um, if you don't want to use libraries and you just want to pull the Jenkins file out of the repo, that's another valid use case. Right, the idea here is that we want to separate the business logic of our pipelines from the technical implementation. Um, it doesn't matter what tools a team is using. Many teams will frequently be following the same business process that's, that's been approved by you know, the product owner and the security teams, and maybe there's a QA or IVMD team. Right? So the ability to create uh, tool agnostic pipeline templates that separate out that business logic from the fact that you know, I happen to be using Node to run my unit tests, which is really an implementation detail that you know, teams should be able to configure. So that first is that Organizational governance, right? There's a big difference between an organization saying everyone has to do container image scanning and then relying on every team to go do that versus uh, with this model saying everyone is going to do container image scanning because you're inheriting a common pipeline template that implements it, but you get to tell us exactly what build tool you want to use or, or so on and so forth. The second is optimizing pipeline code reuse. Um, 
you know, these libraries can now become, you know, either open source or a centralized portfolio of tool integrations. So teams don't have to start from scratch anymore. You can have a, uh, a set of libraries that are building blocks to construct your mature pipelines. And then throughout the organization, as new tool integrations are completed, they are added to that portfolio of, of building blocks. And now you can drastically accelerate how quickly you can build mature pipelines so that no one's starting from scratch anymore. Um, and the third is simplifying pipeline maintainability. Um, in my opinion, it is a lot easier to manage a, a set of pipeline templates and modularized tool integrations than it is to try and manage, you know, 60 copied and pasted Jenkins files that have been tweaked to fit an individual application's needs. Um, and if I need to make an update to the pipeline that applies to multiple teams simultaneously, I can just update a consolidated pipeline definition that teams are inheriting instead of needing to orchestrate uh, a migration of the pipeline and open pull requests to, to every branch. Um, a lot of these practices are sort of what we've been doing in software for a very long time, separating out business logic from technical implementation. It's just that, that those best practices haven't made their way into pipeline development yet. Right. We, we want to be able to say this is the shell of a workflow we're going to follow, but then be able to swap out tools in and out seamlessly. Um, so that that's an introduction to DevSecOps. The, the too long didn't read here is incorporate security uh, as early as you can and as at any point in the pipeline as you can to embed security into every step of the software development lifecycle. Make sure your application dependencies are secure using something like OWASP Dependency Checker or Nexus or Black Duck. Um, make sure the code you write doesn't have inherent vulnerabilities with static code analysis. Um, if you're using containerization, that's a new artifact we need to scan, so do container image scanning. Uh, we want to make sure the infrastructure we're hosting our applications on are secure through continuous compliance and making sure that, you know, all of the controls have been implemented as they're supposed to. Once we deploy our applications, we want to make sure our interfaces are secure, doing penetration testing, and we want to make sure they're inclusive, doing accessibility compliance scanning, using something like Google Lighthouse or a tool called Ally or, or Ally. Um, and then once you've actually deployed your application, you know, none of this is enough. We still need to monitor the applications in production to make sure they're behaving the way we expect them to. Um, so thank you, everyone, for, for coming to the webinar or listening online. Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, well, Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to write this webinar for the CDF. Um, we will have it on demand on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to to tune in. Um, there's other, other webinars there too. Um, appreciate your time and thank you for an intro to DevSecOps. Great, thank you. Have a great day everyone.